This is Nursing Care of the Child with an Alteration in Mobility, Neuromuscular or Musculoskeletal Disorder, Part 1. So looking at anatomical differences between children and adults for neuromuscular or musculoskeletal. Um, right, a child, a, a newborn, just has, they move everything, but they don't have purposeful movements yet. So we can predict how that's going to change we can't say exactly how fast it will happen, but we know what they're going to develop next. So it's, it proceeds in a predictable sequence. Um, but they do have full range of motion at birth, just not that purposeful controlled movement. On a child, we worry about spinal injuries because their spinal cord is more mobile than an adult. Um, myelination of the nerves doesn't happen until about two years of age. And so we see improved uh, motor skills happening as that myelination uh, occurs. Um, the skeleton on a child's bones are not fully ossified until late adolescence, really till they're done growing. And so that makes for a difference in the sort of injuries that they have. The ends of the long bones have the um, epiphyseal growth plate, the card which is cartilage, cartilaginous growth plate. It's um, more delicate than a bone. It breaks there more easily, and that can interfere with growth. Um, the good thing, though, when children do break bones, because they're more vascular, they heal faster. And here's a picture of a bone, and here is that growth plate. And this is our concern when kids have fractures that involve the growth plate. Uh, because that's where growth occurs. So common treatments that we use, casts, right? This is to mobilize something. We usually try to mobilize both the joint above and below of where um, the injury is. A splint is um, just for temporary support usually. Fixation, um, we can have um, this is surgery, so open fixation internal reduction. You may see that ORIF, open reduction internal fixation. So that's surgi surgery where they put pins in. Um, we can do pins inside or uh, put them from the outside. Um, cold therapy, the recommendations have it on 20 to 30 minutes off for an hour. Crutches, this is to prevent weight bearing, but people don't know how to use crutches so we really need to teach them to use them properly and that they fit correctly we don't want them pushing up in their underarms they should have a gap there they're using their arms to hold themselves up not uh, their armpits and then traction this is a pulling force to keep things aligned or to get them aligned so here's some different casts long leg cast short leg anything that uh, goes over the hips, we're going to call a spica, whether it's one leg or two, and again, shorten arm for the long, for the arm. Here we have a spica cast with a bar to hold things perfectly, and she gets the same thing on her doll. If we have a child in a spica cast, they're not going to be able to fit in a standard car seat, so we've got to think about that. Um, they also just can't bend, so we may have to get a wheelchair that's reclining. A child who's had a cast for any length of time gets used to it, and they're going to be very frightened when it is taken off. They feel like it's become part of them because they get used to it. We used to always pedal casts, and now it's something that's really only done in the clinic if the skin around there starts looking irritated. But this is what it is. You take usually that pink um, plastic tape and just take a, these kind of round pieces, uh, around the edges and put it around here and that way if there's any um, uneven edges there it's not poking on the skin so now they do it if they start seeing any redness or irritation but it, it used to be more standard than it is now external fixator um, this is used when things for complicated fractures or for limb lengthening so this has uh, metal rings outside with wires between them and then pins going in to the bone. Uh, for the limb lengthening, they'll crank all of those and spread them out 
and we can actually gain quite a bit of bone um, length doing that, a surprising amount. Uh, it says for bone growth we can do up to six inches, um, about a centimeter a month. Um, so yeah, so that's how it's done. They put little nicks in the bone and then stretch and the bone fills in um, as it's elongating. And we'll need to teach them crutch walking. In the meantime, here's a child with uh, that external fixator on. This is called the Eliz Elizarov, and that's for limb lengthening. But sometimes just with a really bad complex fracture, they'll need to do the same sort of uh, exterior fixation. So anytime there's a fracture, we've got to be checking for circulation distal to the fracture, right? CMST, color movement sensation temp. We should also be looking at the level, the amount of edema and ensuring there is a pulse. Uh, our big concern is compartment syndrome. And so some signs of that increased pain, pain that nothing relieves. Uh, increased edema, pale or blue color to the skin. Um, the skin starts feeling cool. Pressure on the nerves can make numbness or tingling, delayed capillary refill, and then if we have a decreased pulse, we're worried, and an absent pulse, we're really worried. That's an emergency. And because the problem is this compartment syndrome, you get swelling where you can't swell out anymore and it starts pushing in, it can push to the point that it occludes um, blood flow, occludes arterial flow. So what they do is make a fasciotomy. They make a cut in the skin and the fascia so that it can stretch further. This can also happen not just from the skin, but from a cast or a splint that's tight on there and the extremity or the, the injury site is still swelling and the cast won't let it swell. Um, so we need to be watching um, with that as well. So home cast care, we usually want them to keep whatever it, the accident area is elevated for 48 hours. Right, swelling can keep getting worse for usually about 48 hours. So we're trying to minimize the swelling with that and we want them to be watching how much swelling there is. Wiggling their toes or their fingers, whichever it is um, regularly, we want them to control their pain. Take pain medication. Um, don't insert anything into the cast. Protect it from wetness. The fiberglass casts actually are waterproof, but there's cotton batting underneath that is not. So a little bit of water spilt on it can just be wiped off, but it can't be submerged in water. So a plastic bag or something um, over it to protect it when they shower. Uh, monitor the skin around there, and if we need to, we can pedal that. And then notify their provider if there's any changes or problems. When I say we want things elevated for 48 hours, we want it elevated like picture A, not picture B, right? Elevated means above the heart. So an arm, you know, up on pillows above the heart. If it's a leg, they need to be laying down so it's truly elevated. Uh, traction. There are three components to traction. The first one is the pulling force. The second one is the counter traction, which is the patient's body weight so that you are not just dragging them, but they're staying there. And then friction that holds them there, holds them into bed. Uh, so the purposes of traction, threefold. One is to fatigue the muscles so that the bones can be realigned. Muscles, especially when you've had a break and injury and everything's, you know, kind of disturbed there, they'll have these muscle spasms. When we're talking about big, strong bones, the humerus or the femur, those muscles, if they spasm, they will pull the bones out of alignment. So we've got to fatigue those muscles, stop them from spasming in order to get things realigned. Then the traction keeps it aligned so that the distal and proximal end stay there. And then it immobilizes it so that they're not moving it around. Um, so bone alignment, right? Our, our goal is to get it in proper alignment. So there are three types of traction. Manual is when usually a physician just takes it and pulls it and gets it back into place. 
um, and you know they're just holding it there. Skin means we're pulling that we usually have the setup of traction but we're pulling just from having uh, ace wraps around the the extremity hooked to the weights. Where it's skeletal we put pins into the bone and I've got some pictures here. I am not going to ask you any questions about the specific types of traction um, for your HESI or whatever. You may actually want to look at them but for me I just want you to know why we do traction, what traction is, not the specific types. All right? so this is skin. See how it's just ace wraps on there onto here and then it's pulling so it's holding um, his legs in place with the weights there. Here we've got the same thing as skin traction but it's pulling a different direction or it's pulling down. This would be our skeletal traction. So this is um, probably a femur fracture and so we've got weights here, right, comes down to here, pulling that distal portion of the femur and keeping it aligned here so that it can heal. Um, so this is poked into the distal femur. So it's actually into the bone, so it's skeletal traction. And the 90-90 is the 90 at the hip, the 90 at the knee. Um, actually, let me go back for a moment. So the things that are important with traction are this weight is ordered by the physician and we want to make sure that weight stays on. It, The muscle spasms are really painful and they can pull that bone out of alignment. So we never, ever, ever release the traction. It stays on there. We move the child as much as we have to to do care, um, but basically we keep that traction pulling. If we have to move, take this child down for x-ray or something, we don't want those swinging, right? Because then they're going to pull heavy, pull light, pull heavy, pull light. So, so you will see somebody kind of holding the strings of the weights. They're not releasing the weight though, they're just preventing them from swinging. Okay, so moving on to congenital neuromuscular disorders. Um, we've got a few of these we're going to look at uh, spina bifida and then muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy. So we'll start with spina bifida. This is um, our spinal cord here, right? Here's the skin. This would be internal organs over here, right down to the coxy. Um, and we've got this one is normal. This has just a dimple in this has a bubble out of the meninges. This has a bubble of the meninges plus the spinal cord. The nerves of the spinal cord uh, came out during uh, fetal development and get pinched between the a couple of vertebrae. So here's a picture of a baby with a myelomeningocele. You'll also hear meningeomyelocele those two prefixes can go either way, but that means we've got both the meninges and the um, nerves in there. And the lower kind of lumbar area is the most common area where this occurs. Here's just that occulta, so it's pulled in rather than the um, meninges bubbling out. So when we have this on a child, that sac is just the meninges. It's very prone to tearing. If it tears, um, it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So that means germs can get in there and we have meningitis. Um, it also is going to change pressures in the brain and make that kid feel really terrible. Um, so we're going to repair this early, 24 to 72 hours of life. Until it's repaired, that child's got to stay prone. We do not want any pressure or anything on that sac. Don't let a diaper touch the sac. Um, our goal is to prevent infection. So when they stool, we're going to clean in everything early, but um, protecting that sac. We still have a baby and a parent, right? So encourage the parent to touch them, kiss them, feed them, you know, just kind of tip the bed up a little bit and turn their head sideways and feed them, treat them like a baby. Um, that this happens um, early, early in fetal development. Uh, most of the time, we're also going to see increased um, 
well, hydrocephalus.